Imperial Yeast is at it again with their Imperialis project, creating yet another unique proprietary strain through hybridization. In addition to its excellent attenuation and rapid reduction of diacetyl, I-10 Mangosteni contributes robust, ripe tropical fruit, strawberry, and lychee notes that complement modern hops. And as a Kvike hybrid, it can be fermented anywhere from 78 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 to 32 degrees Celsius without any negative issues. Head over to imperialyeast.com to learn more about I-10 Mangosteni and be sure to pick some up for your next batch of fruity IPA. Welcome to the Brew Lab. According to the Rheinheitsgebo, beer is defined as containing malt, water, hops, and yeast. But if I learned anything during my years as a lawyer, it's that definitions can be tricky. New hop products like Incognito, which is branded as a 100% hop-derived product, are certainly increasing in popularity, especially in the U.S. And there's a lot that we're still trying to figure out, like how do we use these hop products like Incognito and how do they impact shelf stability? That's the question that Dr. Michael Fesher and a team of John I. Haas and OSU researchers set out to answer, and it's the topic of this week's Applying the Science episode with my co-host, Jordan Folks. I'm so excited to talk about Incognito today. I'm really interested in these flowable hot products, and I loved that this is getting into things like shelf stability because I'm more interested in does it make a better product. Yeah. Uh, you know, at the homebrew level, I'm not too concerned about volume losses, although there, you know, there's something to be said there, but I'm interested to see if I can get new novel, better, more potent, uh, pungent hop character. And so, uh, taking a step further and looking at shelf stability was really interesting to me. Yeah. And this one's really cool too. Cause you know, if you think about the impetus of this study, that was kind of one of the things they were coming to the table with, right? Like are ink, it, it is incognito better for shelf stability than regular T90 pellets. That was kind of one of the questions um, of this study. And, you know, ultimately having listened to the episode and heard the results, everybody said, well, it didn't really change the shelf stability significantly. Uh, right. But there are pieces of this study that that maybe, uh, you know, could in the future, we could revisit and look at and maybe look at some things and see if um, it's possible. Because one of the big takeaways, we'll get into this in the show, is that the transition metals, these oxidizing transition metals or situses of oxidation, they are much higher in pellets than incognito. So it could be that given some tweaks to the study or maybe changing some things up, trying some different con- you know, consumers instead of trained panelists, we might have a different outcome um, in the future. So we'll talk through some of that in the show. Michael brought up some of those issues, and but, but it's a really, really fun study nonetheless, because like you said, it's incognito and shelf stability. So how does this, um, you know, how does incognito impact beer? And first we'll talk about, you know, uh, well... I guess, actually, first, we're going to talk about shelf stability, and then we'll talk about how to use incognito. And Jordan, you have some experience in that. We'll share some of your experience, and we'll also talk about some of the findings of the episode throughout the show. So let's get to it. But first, uh, thank you to all of the patrons out there. If you are listening to the show and you've already signed up as a patron, you rock. And if you haven't yet, you still rock. But I'd love for you to become a patron. So by becoming a patron, you get awesome access to um, rewards like unpublished contributor recipes, discounts at Yakima Valley. Hops.com and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session. Becoming a patron is easy. There's no obligation. You can cancel at any time. And it's because of our patrons that we're able to continue producing content like the Experiment Series, Short and Shoddy, uh, the Brewlosophy Podcast, the Brewlosophy Show on the YouTube channel. There's so much great content that comes to you for free. So if you'd like to help us out by chipping in a few bucks a month, you can. Uh, and you can find more information on how to become a patron at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. You can also support us by using the links at brewlosophy.com slash support. Just start your shopping experience by using the links and we get a small kickback. Every little bit helps and it doesn't change your shopping experience at all. Uh, and uh, all you have to do is start by clicking those links, which are at brewlosophy.com slash support. Feedback is brought to you by Haas, who in collaboration with the Hop Breeding Company, developed an incredible new hop variety known as Talus. As the progeny of Sabro and open pollination, Talus is known to impart beer with a complex blend of intense fruitiness with hints of coconut, oak, and pine, while contributing minimal grassy, oniony, or other undesirable characteristics. When we ran Talus through the Hop Chronicles, a majority of blind tasters rated their preference as a 7 out of 10 or higher and indicated hoppy pale ale and IPA as the style it worked best in. So if you haven't tried tell us yet and you're brewing you don't know what you're missing learn more about this novel variety as well as the other innovative products Haas has to offer at johnihaas.com that's john the letter i h a a s.com 
All right, feedback this week comes from Pete about episode 62 with Dr. Maria Mutsaglu on low sugar and high nitrogen yeast starters. This one we've gotten so much feedback on. I think this may actually be the most popular episode um, that's been downloaded so far. Uh, but Pete asks, hey, Cade, I recently listened to episode 62 of the Brew Lab about low carbon, high nitrogen yeast starters, and I loved it. One follow-up question. Are you aware of any yeast calculator for this approach? I normally use Homebrew Dads or Mr. Malty's online calculator when doing a starter, but I'm wondering if there's any way, any that are more tuned in to this low carbon, high nitrogen approach. I can figure out the amount of DME to add per liter, but I'm curious about one, how much yeast nutrient would I add per liter? And two, how many liters of this type of starter would I need to get the best cell count? If you had time, I'd love to hear any insights you might have. Thanks and thanks for all your great work. Uh, Jordan, have you used this method uh, for yeast starters? I mean, we're mostly uh, you know, straight pitching Imperial these days, but uh, have you used this method for low sugar, high nitrogen starter? I have, and I really want to. I was really intrigued when I saw the results of your study where I believe that you found a better attenuation with yeah. the uh, novel starter approach. But I recall actually on an earlier episode when I was on, we I even looked at uh, like trying to use Mr. Malty or some other yeast calculator with these assumptions and it's telling me no yeast growth. So yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as I can tell the uh, common homebrew calculators out there, just it, this kind of breaks them and they're just not able to understand uh, the relationship that this study has found. Yeah, exactly. And you know, unfortunately, Pete, the, I'm not aware of a calculator out there that currently uses this. And there's kind of one big reason for that. It just hasn't been repeated enough yet. Um, so it's, there's one study out there from uh, Maria Mutsaglu and I think there's obviously been some changes at Sierra Nevada Brewing Company because of those uh, the the findings from that research. Um, so you know. Th- if, if, you know, I don't know if anybody from Sierra Nevada is listening and wants to try to put together a, uh, you know, yeast calculator based on their results, that might be pretty interesting. Um, but there's also not a lot of homebrewers out there, right? Homebrew Dad and Mr. Malty, I mean, Mr. Malty's Jamil Zaina chef, and he put together this calculator doing a crap load of homebrew batches and then counting the yeast at the end of it. So that's unfortunately what we need to do for this work. But I can give you kind of a rule of thumb that worked for me. So again, you can check out my experiment on the website. Just go to uh, the Brewlosophy website, click on the search bar and type in low carbon, high nitrogen, and you'll find this experiment that I did. And like Jordan said, I um, I made a two liter starter, um, which is probably a little low. I'd suggest kind of going a, like more like a, a three, four, or even a five liter starter if you have that size. But all I had was some two liter jars. So I went with two liters and it still worked for me. Um, although I looking back and, and looking at the yeast count that might have been there, I think I underpitched the number of yeast, but they were really healthy and they actually still fermented faster than um, the the normal uh, you know yeast or the normal starter strength, which was a really cool finding. So I encourage you go read that um, five grams of yeast starter per liter. That's kind of the rule of thumb that's been calculated from the different yeast nutrients. You just have to look at the back of the package and then... Uh, uh, and then do some calculations, do some math uh, w- w- and to, to get to the right level. But ultimately, five grams of yeast nutrient per liter is probably a really good rule of thumb. Start with two liters and see what that works for you. I've heard from some other people that that's been successful for them. Um, and if you do need to increase your starter size or you're not getting good results, go from there. And also write back and let me know. The more information that we have about this, the more likely it is that we can make one of these calculators or, or have somebody put that together in the future. All right, after this short break, We'll be back talking about the use of incognito and how hops affect shelf stability. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel. And Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high quality stainless gear. Like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow off, and it can hold up to 4 psi of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest priced all in one electric brew systems out there. And their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. 
We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. The folks at John I. Haas have been releasing a bunch of really interesting hop products to help brewers get more hot flavor and aroma into their beers without the yield loss and other flavor issues that come with using whole hops and whole pellets. But there's still a lot that's unknown about Incognito. One question that needed to be answered was, how does Incognito affect shelf stability? You know, I never even thought about that, but I guess it seems kind of logical that maybe it does have shelf stability uh, advantages, at least in hoppy beers, because, you know, it's already been converted to a liquid, so there's less vegetal matter that's getting into the, the wort. Um, it makes sense to me that maybe there is some sort of advantage. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you think about like, you know, things that hops add to beer, right? It's flavor and aroma and bitterness. Those are kind of the big ones that we want, right? But they also add a whole bunch of other stuff. Just like you said, there's plant material that gets added. There's, you know, um, hops are a vector for shelf stability issues. I mean, I think we've all had uh, or at least seen pictures of those hazy, super hopped IPAs that are yellow and juicy one week and then like a week later are purple and look like swamp water <laughs> you know um so th- i mean those are things that hops add to the beer it's not just flavor aroma and bitterness but incognito is a super critical co2 extract so your ex- the whole goal of these products is to extract out the things that we want like flavor and aroma right Right. And it reminds me of, you know, cryo or something like that, but in a more flowable format. That was the whole point is uh, maybe there's some good things in hops and maybe there's some less desirable components and maybe we can make a product that uh, just gives us what we want. Um, But obviously, as the more we dive into these things, it turns out, you know, there is some kind of element that that's maybe missing with a uh, extracted product and maybe there are what we might on one day consider a bad thing in fact you need a little bit of of that in the background to just make beer taste like what we think beer tastes like (laughs) yeah right you need a little bit of that what i call hop character right it's just like that resinous you know kind of planty like material that tastes that makes it taste like beer right i mean it makes it taste like a beer with hops in it i'm not just trying to drink a sugary sweet juice liquid Right. I want that like hop flavor to offset that sweetness of the beer. That's totally that. That's a great point. And of course, you know, Incognito is specifically crafted for Whirlpool editions. Right. So it's not intended. I mean, I I, I, I don't know if you can use it, Jeff, if you're listening to the show, shoot me an email and let me know if you can use it for like bittering additions or uh, dry hop. I'm not sure why you would want to, but it's specifically crafted for Whirlpool. Right. To replace that Whirlpool edition. So you're probably still going to be using hops in the boil and or in the dry hop or you know use all of the different extracts like kettle ready in the boil and then incognito at the whirlpool and spectrum at the dry hop i mean those are the john i haas brands but there are other options that are out there um you know but that's the whole point right and and i guess like the whirlpool is that amount of time that like when you turn off the heat to the kettle and either you immediately start transferring your wort through your chiller over to the fermenter or more commonly you're stirring the wort in some way or mixing the wort in a circular motion which creates this like really dense tube cone in the center of the vessel and that allows you to rack off, rack off like clear wort and in commercial breweries that can take a long time that can take 20 30 45 minutes depending on the size of the brewery right as you're trying to spin this down and run it through the chiller so it's a good opportunity to add some more hops get a little bit flavor that's below the boiling point so and maybe below the volatilization point for a lot of flavor and aroma compounds so you're you're keeping all of these in the whirlpool and of course we've been doing this with t90 pellets and whole cones for a long time right i mean we've been using regular hot pellets uh to do this that's kind of the cool benefit of incognito is you can do this at the whirlpool but maybe you're not getting all of that other stuff right the other plant material and everything in there 
Yeah, and for a you know heavily hopped IPA, West Coast or East Coast style, uh, you're going to have a substantial amount of hops often added in that whirlpool, and there's very significant volume losses at the whirlpooling stage, and just a bunch of stuff to clog, potentially clog up your chiller or your filter or whatever. And so um, there's clearly a technical advantage here, but beyond that, you know, does it make an interesting or more you know, characterful flavor. And that's what really interested me about it. Yeah. And that's, of course, one of the goals of the study. Well, I mean, I think that's the overarching goal of this whole study. And there were several different parts of the study um, that that they looked at today. So the first thing that they looked at was, um, you know, what are the 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 transition metal concentration in hop extracts like incognito and in pellets right and so transition metals are important because they're um the, they're catalysts for oxidation reactions so when if you have like iron for example or copper um, in your wort those are going to speed up the amount of oxidation, right? So your shelf stability is going to be shorter. Your, your beer's not going to last as long. So they wanted to look at, and so Haas had done some preliminary research and kind of shown, hey, there's a lot less of these transition metals in these hop extracts because it's going through supercritical CO2 extraction. And uh, so maybe that might improve the shelf stability of beers. So this is a really, really cool uh, sort of first takeaway of the study, and that's what we'll talk about um, in this segment, and then we'll switch over and talk about the other aspects of the study, which is how does incognito taste compared to pellets, and then how do they taste when you age them over 12 weeks as compared to pellets, which I think is really fun, and there's a lot of nuance to get in here, like lexicon developing, like how do you determine what a beer tastes like? What does aging character taste like? What does incognito character taste like? What do pellets taste like? It was really cool. Um, um, some some uh, things there, but wanted to start with this whole shelf stability concept, and we can start with those transition metal metals. So the big takeaway from this study is that this study confirmed exactly what Haas had said. There are lower concentrations of what I'm going to air quote or podcast quote the bad metals, bad transition metals, copper and iron. There are lower concentrations of copper and iron in hop extracts. So when you add those to the whirlpool, you're adding fewer amounts of these catalysts that catalyze oxidation reactions, which is really interesting, right? That's one of those things that I really want to come back to and look at, or I want somebody to come back, not me personally, um, but I, I want somebody to come back to and look at this and go like, okay, wow, how much is it and what does it actually do to shelf stability? There was kind of a big caveat in this. One is that they used pellets as the bitter addition so it's not a pure like extract beer they could have used like flex or kettle ready or something like that um, in the boil and not used pellets at all in the extract batches just so that there's no like you know oils or transition metals that are brought over from the bittering additions now i'm not terribly upset about that right i mean you're most likely going to use pellets or something like that in the boil um you know so adding pellets in there's not really that big of a deal to me but pellets could carry over some transition metals again most of the pellet most of the transition metals michael mentioned this this is another kind of interesting you know sub nugget i guess from the study is that a lot of these transition metals fall out during the whirlpool, during when the trube is settling out, they bind to the trube and they just settle into the bottom of that hop cone. So, you know, the pellets, uh, did they bring transition metals in? It's possible. Um, but is it really going to have affected the outcome? I don't know. Um, so again, I'd like to see maybe in the future a study where they, they do just extracts. Yeah, this brings up a few thoughts for me. One is I find it fascinating that hops are a source of oxidation here. Um, you know, like you mentioned earlier, hazy IPAs can notoriously go purple. Yeah. I believe that part of that is uh, they're thinking maybe part of the heavy metals and oats um, that are commonly used in hazy IPAs, which is why you don't see West Coast IPAs turning purple. But nonetheless, it seems that hoppy beers are more prone to oxidation. And I kind of always assumed that there was just so much hoppy goodness in there that it's just easier to detect oxidation, maybe comparative to like a mass market lager, not to mention how good their ox oxygen control system is. Yeah. But just there's more to lose. Um, it's more noticeable. But it, this is really fascinating to me that, in fact, Part of this is a function of the metal ions that exist in hops, and we're clearly getting more of those when we use more and the whirlpool, the dry hop, etc. 
Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this would apply for dry hop too. That's a really good point. And I, I mean, this obviously this study just looked at Whirlpool, but there you're going to do the same thing um, in the dry hop. You're going to add a whole bunch of these metals. And so if you're using whole cones and pellets, uh, you know, as a dry hopper, as a whirlpool, you're adding these metals. Now, I also want to say one thing too here. There are, I'm going to, again, put these in podcast quotes because it's an oversimplification, but it's good enough for here. There are good <laughs> metals that are added, right? Magnesium, sodium, calcium, zinc, yeast need those for fermentation, right? So, you know, that could be that um, one of the the, uh, the reasons why hops were originally added to beer 100 years ago was because hops improved the shelf stability of beer, right? They added maybe some of these things that increased fermentation, right? We did the show way back episode eight, uh, where we talked about the freshening power of hops. That's why hops were originally added. They actually made the beer um, more shelf stable, you know, but now we've kind of come full circle where we're adding just crap loads of hops <laughs> to the beer and maybe reducing that shelf stability a little bit. <laughs> well, and obviously part of it was that um, little did they know that it was fighting off lactic acid production um, due to lac- lactobacillus as hop intolerance. But um, one thing I find that's interesting here from kind of the homebrew and brew philosophy perspective is this is a really strong argument um, again, uh, for separating from the trube when going into the fermenter. And uh, the brew philosophy experiments, I think, have consistently shown that... Um, a tube free batch is not necessarily better. Uh, I in fact do a commonly do a settling step where I'm racking uh, truly clear wort off of the hot break and cold break into my fermenter. Um, and I'm making, I think really good beer and not have any problems with it. But I believe that the fir- the very first brew philosophy experiment, the great tube experiment found that the uh, truby beer fermented quicker and more completely. And so clearly there are some uh, mineral um, yeast, benefits in there. Uh, but I think that um, maybe that's one where yeast nutrient comes in. Uh, we can add some of that uh, manually. But two, uh, it, we're not aging things for a year at a time or sitting on warm <laughs> sh- store shelves in, in Texas. Yeah. So I think that some of these issues of shelf stability just don't necessarily ref- uh, impact the average home brewer who's making a keg of beer and it's getting drank relatively quickly at the source that it was brewed and it's always cold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's always stored cold too. And and I mean that's a, an important part of this, right? Maybe we should talk about some of these, you know, factors that improve or that that affect shelf stability, right? Um, because there are lots of different things. I mean, one of the things that that we talked about was oxygen in these transition metals, but you just hit on a really big one too temperature, right? Temperature is going to speed up these oxidation reactions. And if you're storing the beer warm, or like you mentioned, on a grocery store shelf in a hot Texas grocery store, yeah, that that could be bad. Or if you've just got your kegs sitting out in the garage, um, you know, aging, quote unquote, or just, you know, lagering in the garage when the when it's 80 degrees outside, that's not going to be, um, you know, particularly great for your beer. But oxygen's a big one. So obviously, you want to mitigate oxygen ingress. And that's actually a big one for you, Jordan, is you spent a lot of time thinking about how oxygen gets into your brewing process. Totally. I was at the homebrew store yesterday and they now have Biofine and I would love to try that, but you add such a small amount that I don't know how I would get like a milliliter into my keg in an oxygen free <laughs> format because with the gelatin dose, I can add a half cup or something and I can um, use an oxygen free transfer system uh, to inject that via the uh, gas in post. And I just don't know how to do that with a single milliliter. So little things like that. It's like I am absolutely terrified of oxidation. And I think that <laughs> of the things that we've tested at Brewlosophy, that's one of the most um, significant things if we were to look at it kind of from a meta-analysis standpoint that we consistently see a the tasters can significantly detect the odd beer out when oxidation is the variable. <laughs> remember that one that you brought to us at uh, the PBC club? <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that one. I felt so bad for you guys, like sitting there knowing that one of the beers tasted horrible, right? I mean, it was bad. It was cardboardy and gross. It was not a good beer. Um, yeah. And just like standing there, like watching everybody taste them and almost everybody. I mean, I think, I don't remember how many tasters we had at the PBC group, but let's say it was 15 or so. I want to say like 10, 10 or 12, when they hit that second beer, they just went, oh, like, <laughs> like what, what did he do to us? What did he give us? Uh, that was fun, though. Well, and I recently did this um, hop water experiment where one had yeast and one didn't, and the one that didn't have yeast uh, 
clearly was oxidized, even though I did my best with closed transfers, etc. And oh my gosh, the one that was oxidized was like brown, like swamp water and <laughs> tasted so horrendous. Like the looks on people's faces when they took that first whiff or sip was like, you know, putrid death. And so clearly <laughs> oxidation is not our friend regardless of style, but hoppy beers are um, maybe the worst of the worst in terms of oxidation problems. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's because a lot of the components that hops bring like, um, you know, the terpenes and stuff like that, you know, they can oxidize and oxidize into com or well, you know, aldehydes, polyphenols, all these things. I mean, anything that's in beer can oxidize and turn into something different. Um, you know, uh, and I think that's a lot of the problem, right? Is like hops bring so much flavor and aroma. Like you said, there's a lot to lose, right? There's a lot that can change and then it's no longer hoppy. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Yeah. And so I think that a lot of the classic um, telltale signs telltale signs of oxidation are things like uh, caramel flavors, sweet candy, cardboard honey. And a lot of that I think is actually really the malt character oxidizing and so um when we get into oxidized hops i mean it can get really gross like astringent and just weird bitterness and just off yeah yeah totally right and and i think that's uh that's one of those things i want to talk about in the next segment is like what do we what do you and i think of whenever we think of aged beers and i'll talk to you a little bit about what the the um i'll sum up i guess what the panelists thought as well in the study but it's so interesting right to think of like uh, you know oxygen causing this issue and again the transition metals causing this issue too right they're the they're a catalyst for this oxidation reaction so they're making it happen faster and i guess actually interestingly this is the second time in the last few months that i've talked about metals causing issues in beers on that kettle souring episode uh with daniel lepage from creature comforts he was talking about iron accumulation in the yeast it's taking up the iron because it's using it during fermentation and then if you leave it to sit in in the beer it causes all these shelf stability and even a, a metallic off flavor um in their sours which i thought was really interesting too uh you know so this it's it's really cool to think or really interesting to think about all the different ways that beer can be attacked <laughs> uh, and maybe not be as shelf stable. Right. So how do we improve that? What are some of the best ways to improve sh shelf stability? Um, and maybe we can start with the hot side. Yeah, yeah. I think we got to start with the hot side, uh, mostly because this is an episode about Whirlpool, right? Incognito and, and that stuff. I mean, obviously, cold side oxidation, I think, is the biggest vector for, uh, you know, oxidation getting inside of your beer. That's when it's most important to me. But having, uh, you know, interestingly, having a good hot and cold break, uh, I learned that from this episode, right? The, the Trube is actually pulling out a lot of those transition metals. So if you have a really good hot or cold break, and the trube is settling down to the bottom of your fermenter, maybe combined with a good whirlpool, you actually pull out a lot of the transition metals and maybe improve your shelf stability. I thought that one was really interesting, but also, you know, watching your raw ingredients and that kind of stuff as well. What do you think, Jordan? Yeah, I thought it was really interesting because of the application of the style in American Pale Ale. Uh, I believe that our Brulosophy experiments have been um, have not been IPAs. And so I really uh, want to add that to my list of things to investigate is do we see a significant impact, um, be it taste, aroma, or even measurable things like attenuation, etc. When we are fermenting truly clear beer that's uh, free of virtually all hot and cold break um, versus an IPA that um, has uh, a normal amount of um, hot and cold break uh, in the fermenter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How much of that trube is actually getting over? Because like you said earlier, there's a lot of benefits from that trube. But then again, you know, there's a lot of things in it as well that could be causing causing issues. Well, I think it's time for us to talk about some of the, the second half of the study, which is what are the flavor and aroma impacts of incognito? And how does the beer age over time, right? How does incognito versus T90 pellets age over time? So let's take a break. And uh, when we come back, we'll get into those details. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the time's IPA was expected to be bitter and clear, and there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the West and the East Coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than morebeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. Thank you. 
Whirlpool additions can certainly add a huge amount of flavor and aroma to beer, but they might also come with some things that aren't as good, like transition metals, which are sources of oxidation. And we spent the last segment talking about shelf stability and those transition metals, so let's switch gears and talk about the flavor and aroma of hop extracts. So Jordan, you've actually had some experience using Incognito. Yeah, so um, they have Citra and Mosaic available, and um, I know the uh, Dry Hop version product also has um, a new couple varieties available for homebrewers specifically. Um, Galaxy is one of them. I can't remember if Incognito has come out with those yet or not, but so to date, I've only used the Mosaic and Citra varieties and, you know, two of my favorite IPA hops, so <laughs> right. totally <laughs> satisfied with those being the initial offerings. And um, at the homebrew level, it comes in, I believe, these little 20 gram jars. And they're these little plastic, you know, jars that kind of looks like a like a mini like Tylenol bottle or something like that. They're really small. <laughs> um, and uh, you, you know, you asked me, how do we use this effectively? The first challenge is getting the sticky goo out of the bottle because <laughs> we're holding it at yeah. refrigeration temperature, right? You know, you're not freezing this stuff, um, but it's very viscous. And if you were to just open it cold and turn it upside down, I mean, it would be like a blizzard at Dairy Queen or whatever. It's not going <laughs> to come out of the package, right? And so they recommend actually warming it in some um, like a, a warm warm water bath to kind of, uh, you know, get it a little bit more flowable. And that's really important. Um, one recommendation that I might give to listeners is wear some disposable or washable, um, rubber or, uh, latex gloves. Cause if this stuff gets on your hands, you're not getting it <laughs> off. You know, it is yeah. really, really sticky. So, um, According to the manufacturer's instructions, um, once you get it in that flowable state, you're going to add it directly to the whirlpool. Now, um, listening to some uh, brewers talk about it and stuff, uh, I think that you um, a, a big thing here why we add it to the whirlpool is heat. So uh, you don't want to add this to a cool pool of like 120 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. Uh, I think that um, it, if you add it directly at flame out, it's definitely going to work. Uh, you can probably go down to 180, but the lower you go the more it's going to struggle to go into solution. Mm, um, that's good and another point. part of that is agitation. Uh, it seems that true whirlpooling, mechanical uh, constant stirring via a pump or some sort of recirculation device really helps it get into solution because when you add this stuff to um, uh, your wort, it's like adding uh, olive oil to water. You just see it bubbling <laughs> and sitting on the top. It's really difficult to get into solution. And so I think that's uh, one of the reasons why they don't recommend it as a dry hop because it's just going to glob to the stay as a glob and it's not going to go into solution without that heat. Wow, that's interesting. There's so many really good tips there because I I've actually only brewed with it on like a, a small commercial scale, like our research brewery um, scale, <clears throat> but I've never seen it on the homebrew level. So it actually comes in like little Tylenol bottles, and you have to like pour it out in there. How much do you have to use? Are you talking like you know just a small amount, or are you using like the whole bottle in a batch? Great question. Um, so uh, according to the um, ratios of approximate. Um, comparison to T90 pellets or pole cone for that matter, uh, the little 20 gram uh, pill bottle, if you will, is roughly about four ounces worth of hops. Now, I don't know if that's true in terms of flavor impact, um, but in terms of bitterness, at, at the very least, or isomerable alpha acids, I think that's a decent rule of thumb. And earlier, you know, you said that it replaces um, T90 or whole cone um, hops. But I think that the recommendation is actually no more than 80% if you want to have <laughs> a more true to type experience. Um, I have yet to do a solely incognito one, but I, so I've been blending it as one of my additions. And so um, I am concerned about oxidation with everything, of course, uh, hops uh, especially. And it's got a, um, you know, hermetic seal tab or whatever on it. Uh, and so once I've broken that seal, I don't want to reuse this product. So I would just assume this represents four ounces. Um, so that means for an IPA, you know, you've got a couple ounces left that you could ostensibly use in a five gallon batch um, of world of a heavily whirlpooled beer. Uh, and then it's just all in. And re honestly, you're not going to get it's hard to get even all of it out. So uh, in my whirlpool, I'll, you know, safely or try to be safely splash some hot wort in there to try to rinse the rest out because it's it's so thick a lot actually sticks to the side of the bottle too 
Oh, that's a good idea. Like rinse the bottle with some of the hot wort as well. Yeah. Um, and that's a great point about replacing T90 pellets. Yeah. Jeff will kick me um, if he's actually uh, l- listening to this episode. Um, yeah. They're, they're definitely not intended to fully replace pellets um, in the Whirlpool. Um, it's an, it's intended to help, right? Like you said, uh, up to 80%. Um, you know, and because like you mentioned, there are some of these things that are in hops that we like in beer. You, you brought that up earlier and that's totally true. So, okay, cool. So that's around four ounces of, you know, the, 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 you know, like, like a, a equivalent to a four ounce dosage of Whirlpool hops. That's a lot in a Whirlpool, but you know, great. I, you know, it, it does make me interested. I wonder too. Um, I'd have to ask Jeff this and maybe I will for some feedback. Like, is there a way if I only wanted to use two ounces, let's say of it, you wanted to use like half the bottle, is there a way to like purge some CO2 in the top or do you have to use like nitrogen or something like that? And then, or can you just like close the bottle and use it within two weeks and it's still fine? I'm interested. I don't know. It's just, it's so small, you know, in that yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. really, you might as well open this thing up and use it. And so I can see that why they made it a 20 gram uh, vial instead of 10 gram, because it's hard enough to get the 20 grams out. And so I think <laughs> sure, that 10 true. grams might be a little better because then it's only two ounces. And for lighter whirl- whirlpooling applications or uh, not being like such a great percentage at the homebrew level in a five gallon batch scale. Um, but I think that this would be a really good tool in a 10 gallon brew, uh, given that size. But, you know, uh, I I think for IPA about an ounce or ounce and a half per gallon is a great whirlpool. Um, just lower your bitter, bitterness additions on the front end to account for the inevitable isomerization of alpha acids that you're going to get. If you're really worried about that, um, maybe lower your temp to like 180 during your whirlpool. Uh, so that's the classic uh, manufacturer's instructions. But there's a bit of a growing underground movement of actually using incognito as a dip hop. And I I believe that this was pioneered by Kelsey at uh, North Park Brewing in San Diego, which in my opinion is maybe the best IPA and West Coast Pilsner brewer in America. He is truly brewing incredible beers. And in fact, he was a home brewer and he kept winning gold in NHC for IPA. And eventually he's like, all right, I guess I got to open a brewery. And (laughs) that's something I learned from him is this kind of dip popping method. So what he does is he runs the first like barrel or so of the production or the professional batch hot into the fermenter and adds incognito in directly into the fermenter. And I don't know if he's agitating that or not. Um, and in my experience trying this at home, I think you should, uh, but then he turns the heat X on and he runs the rest in cold. And so it's like a, a dip hop or fermentation, dry hop, etc. And he's actually talked to John I and they're like, eh, we don't think you should do that. Um, <laughs> okay. but in my experience, drinking his beers and using this method at home, Dear God, it is such an incredible hop experience. And I really think he's onto something here. Um, And granted, I haven't isolated it and only done incognito in the Whirlpool versus only in this dip hop hop application. Um, But it is so incredibly beautiful and bright. Um, In fact, I believe that we just this week uh, of recording, we released uh, my first article showing how to use these advanced hop products. Um, so check out the Brew It Yourself uh, article. I did one with all Mosaic hops, uh, but using T90s, Whole Cones, Lupomax, Incognito, and Spectrum. And that article <laughs> actually shows me adding Incognito at both the Whirlpool and uh, the Dip Hop method. Wow. Yeah. Adding adding all the things, adding all the hops, <laughs> which is a really cool episode. Yeah. Check or a really cool article on that Brew It Yourself. Check it out. Um, you, it was so interesting. I mean, I think you also need to do that experiment too, right? The, the, the Dip pop versus whirlpool let's add that to the list too because i think that could be really really interesting i like you said i'd worry a little bit about being able to mix it in in the fermenter but maybe if you've got enough hot word in there you know maybe you can use a little bit warmer word even too like a you know fresh off the boil word and then mix it up a little bit easier at that higher temperature yeah that's what i'm doing and i will say is i really wonder about how effective this stuff is in terms of i'm you're seeing oil on the side of your brew kettle and in this kind of dip hopping method where and i am going straight hot into the um uh the fermenter uh and it actually finishes a little warmer so i have to then further chill it down on like a chest freezer because the blending of you know cool and hot liquid is above pitching temperature for what i'm comfortable with for an ipa or west coast bills or something um 
there's glue stuck to the side of the fermenter at the end of the fermentation. So I think that <laughs> getting this stuff into solution is actually really difficult. And I really love incognito uh, in theory, but I think that there's still work to be done to better integrate it into the wort solution, at least at the homebrew scale. Yeah, that's interesting. And some really good tips on how to use that if you're interested in using incognito, right? Like using getting things out of the bottle and getting it all mixed in, maybe try it in dip hopping. Now, another question for you, Jordan, that's kind of more related to the the study that we talked about. Have you looked at any of the like shelf stability of using any of these things or not yet? Hmm. Um not necessarily on purpose, but you know, the keg doesn't get drank <laughs> sure. in a day. And the last one that I made, um, that's actually featured in this article, uh, the, the shelf stability for a, you know, a normal homebrew level of having friends over and pouring pints, uh, it, it seemed really fresh all the way through the end of the keg, but this stuff isn't lasting much longer than a month at the rate that I'm giving it away and, um, enjoying it. So, uh, and it's cold the whole time. So I don't think I have a really good grasp on that. But it's not like uh, lasting five days in your kegerator and then it's like turned. It, so it's, it's it seems to be staying bright. And, you know, there's something unique about it. And it's kind of hard to put my finger on what exactly it is. But it's just this like bright like dare I say tropical um, kind of experience that that it's just not as like vegetal. And uh, I don't think that it would work well with a hundred percent oil pro- flowable products. I mean, not that it'd be bad, but it would just be missing something there. And so I think that um, that's why I like blending different uh, uh products is that you get the best of both worlds. And I think that we can really push the limits on how great beer can be by using this as a tool in the toolkit, not the only lever that we pull. Yeah. And I mean, what you just mentioned too, that there's like there, there, uh, you know, is maybe a little bit of something that's different between the T90 and the incognito when you use it in the Whirlpool. That's totally consistent with the results of the study, right? I mean, one of the big parts of the study that, that they went through was they brewed beers with pellets as a Whirlpool edition and with incognito at a Whirlpool edition. And they did it at different dosing rates. So like a very low dosing rate up to a very high dosing rate um, in the Whirlpool. And then they served it to a trained panel and asked the panel, hey, characterize these flavor and aroma difference. And they did see a dosing rate effect. So like lower doses of the T90 pellets resulted in lower flavor and aroma. Now, lower doses of incognito still had higher flavor and aroma. But as you increase... Uh, or, you know, as you increase the amount of T90 pellets, you're increasing uh, the amount of hop flavor. I'm going to put that in air quotes. So it's not just citrus and tropical and fruity like you get from Incognito, but when you're at increasing the dose of T90, you're also increasing resinous, um, you know, and, and those kinds of characteristics. And resinous to me, if you ever see that in a paper, resinous to me means hop oil. That's like the hop character, right? It is like the thing. It's like the plant material. It's the green matter. It's like hops. It's not dank necessarily, although it can be, right? I'm not talking about like marijuana or weed, but just the, if you smell a hop, you know like, oh, that's a hop, right? And it's consistent across all the varieties. It's that thing that's similar and it makes it a hop. That's what resinous is to me whenever I think of it that way. And so that resinous character increases with T90 pellets as you increase and add more T90 pellets to it. So that's totally consistent with your experience brewing with incognito over versus pellets in the whirlpool. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be as like tongue coating as a really heavy uh, whirlpool and dry hopped with all whole cone or T90. And you know, like um, sometimes like an heavily hopped, like hazy IPAs, especially you can get that like kind of like gritty uh, scraping hop experience on your tongue. Um, it seems it with my initial trials that incognito uh, doesn't, you know, you're getting the same level of hops in terms of like bitterness and like like volume or weight equivalent but uh cutting back on that tongue scraping experience yeah which for me that's been a that's a problem right in some of these um ipas like this hot burn kind of character that tum that hot burn tongue scraping experience when you overdo the the pellet hopping man it's like sometimes it's like it really does taste like we've all done it or i think we've all done it tasting a raw pellet right just like putting a little bit on your tongue just to see what happens and you do it and you go oh my god it's like so bitter and so intense um it's that kind of flavor it's that hot burn 
burn. And so maybe that's a maybe if you're suffering or some of your beers are suffering from hot burn, one, you should use less hops, but also maybe try using the incognito. If you still want that aroma at that level, try using a hot product. Yeah, it's like it's more bright, less fuzzy, if that makes sense. Yeah. Ah, there you go. More bright, less fuzzy. That's good. I like that. Um, and so that was one of the things that the that the panelists went through. It was looking through these different beers, characterizing them, characterizing the flavor and aroma differences. And honestly, both of the beers had citrus, tropical, hoppy flavor, which is important from the incognito perspective. I'm not sure exactly which variety that they used. I'm sure it's in my notes somewhere. I think it was citra. It was. Um, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, and so that's very consistent with Citra, right? Like Citrus, Tropical, those are the kinds of flavors that you want um, from those Whirlpool. So you get it from both. And I want to stop here and make that point as well. Because we talk about like, oh, is Incognito better than flavor or than T90, um, T90 pellets? Yeah, yes. You know, well, yes and no, right? I mean, maybe not. But does it have to be better? No. I mean, there are other things that come along with it. As long as the flavor impact is the same as T90 pellets, it's another tool in the toolkit, right? It gives you optionality when you're brewing, and maybe you can do some creative things, like, for example, dip hopping with it, right? Um, and 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 uh, making some really great beers that way. Um, you know, you it's a it's another option. So it doesn't have to be better, right? As long as it's the same as T90 and you can use it the you know and it gives you benefits in other ways like reducing your yield you know um, technical issues like whirlpool and and all that sort of stuff that's a that's a good result for um, this kind of product so I didn't want that to get lost in all this discussion of like T90 versus incognito if they taste the same that's still a good outcome. It's kind of lucky for Haas that there was like really no downside to this <laughs> research unless it came back that like, oh yeah, no, 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 no. Incognito is way worse than T90 and it kills the shelf stability. Don't use it. That would have been terrible, but right. <laughs> we didn't have those results. So yeah, to me, it's not a replacement. It's a supplement. And I think that using them together is the best uh, scenario here. It's going to give you the best of both worlds. Um, I think that if we were to do a purely uh, flowable beer using Incognito for an IPA kind of format, it might be a little thin or, or just lacking some of those uh, inherently vegetal characters that we associate with that style. Um, but I think that using them in combination, you can get you know all the good things while minimize, suppressing some of the bad things. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited for this product and I, I can't wait to start to get like New Zealand varieties and other American varieties. Um, I don't know that I need an incognito, you know, uh, pearly or holler tail middle fruit, but <laughs> pearly, uh, it's pretty yeah, cool right. with, uh, <laughs> as we get more options on the, um, sexy hop side. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, and there's a huge amount of hops. I mean, I know Haas has got things in the works, um, you know, and, and I'm sure they're going to continue expanding their products as brewers want more and more of these kind of characteristics. So it so again, it was a big takeaway from this part, T90 pellets versus, um, you know, um, hop extracts is there is some difference in the way that they taste depending on the dosage level. But like you said, Jordan, use them together and you may actually, you know, have something that's greater than the sum of its parts. Right. Um, but the other big question from this study and kind of the whole thing that kicked off the entire research study was how do these beers age over 12 weeks? And so we talked about the lower transition metals that are that are found in the extracts, right? Those are being stripped out whenever um, the during the CO2 extraction process. So they're not making it into the beer, maybe not contributing to oxidation or maybe, you know, um, increasing the shelf stability. And that would be a pretty cool finding, right? So that was one of these things. Does incognito increase the shelf stability of the beer? Um, so they also looked at this, right? Michael and the team brewed some beer, used the beers that they characterized, and then aged them over 12 weeks with a trained sensory panel. And I was actually on this sensory panel, which was really cool. Um, and I can say that both beers actually taste crappy <laughs> at the end of 12 weeks, as we would kind of expect. I mean, we were kind of forced aging these beers. I believe they were sitting at room temperature or at least like, you know, slightly elevated room temperature for 12 weeks. So, you know, that's not how we would want to treat beers if they had been stored cold, they might have survived over 12 weeks a little bit better. But we were trying to really pour, force the aging and characterize that. And so one of the first things that I wanted to take away from this episode was how difficult it is to characterize age. 
that's hard. Um, I wasn't part of the lexicon development, um, you know, but but I can imagine like trying to taste a whole bunch of aged beers and like make different descriptors for what aged character tastes like. Right. I mean, I think I, I think most of us know when you have like an old beer, it tastes flat. It's not as like there's not as bright. It's not as hoppy. But it. I, I always think about what my wife says It's that it doesn't have its upness right? It loses its upness. And I'm like, man, I wish I could like put that on a Cata sensory ballot because I feel like that, that, that categorizes it. It's like, that's makes sense. It's just not as good. Um, but it's difficult. So thinking about things like caramely, cardboard, hard candy, honey, sweet, sweet, aromatic, you know, any of these different flavor characteristics, that's really hard to do. I mean, I, I don't know how much time you've spent thinking about aged beer <laughs> characteristics, Jordan, but um, do you have any thoughts or any way to add on those uh, the, those characteristics that you get whenever you taste an aged beer? No, I'm with your wife. I I'm really I really struggle to put words to sensory experiences. Um, I don't think I'm the best judge for that reason. I think that I can uh, say this is a great IPA. This is a bad one. This is a 42. This is a 22. But when it comes to writing in the like the qualitative description i'm not good at it i just i know good beer i know bad beer i know oxidized beer uh i know over attenuated beer but trying to like convert this to like fruits and vegetables and stuff it's just like (laughs) i'm not as good at it and i'm okay with that yeah and so this is also one of the struggles for training a sensory panel to do like aged beer studies is because you have to be consistent over time right and you're doing this over 12 weeks so you train the study you train the panelists and then they have to remember what you know hard candy tastes like and how hard candy tastes different than honey right Um, to be able to like check those sorts of characteristics and there's other things like malty and you know of course you're also looking at the hop characteristics too does it still have its citrus flavor does it still have its tropical flavor is it resinous now you know or does it have herbal tea character which we've seen with some cascade you know as they're aging over time um you know so you've got all these sorts of questions and another big caveat um to this study is that again this was done this aging study was done with a trained sensory panel technically it would be better to do a true shelf stability study with consumers and you want to ask them uh, whether they would continue to purchase the product Right. And that's kind of your best determinant of shelf stability because shelf stability means when will consumers stop buying it? Right. (laughs) Or like when does the beer go bad and people won't drink it anymore? So you need consumers to do that. And you can use a statistical tool called survival analysis to do that. So doing this with a trained panel is fine. It's good. Right. It's information technically might have been a little bit better to use consumers and also a lot more difficult, right, (laughs) to go out and find consumers to do this um, and then use survival analysis. You got to get a lot of people. You got to get, you know, go out to the consumers. You're not going to get them to come to your um, sensory session in a controlled environment. You're going to have to go to them. So it's been very difficult and maybe, you know, cost prohibitive for the experiment, for example. But that's something to keep in mind as we go through this. Yeah, that's the blessing and the curse of being a good brewer is it's like really hard to enjoy beer in the wild anymore because (laughs) there is so much mediocre oxidized beer out there, especially in cans and package and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, on one hand, I'm sure the vast majority of consumers don't care, don't know the difference and it sells, but me, you know, being a oxidation freak brewer, (laughs) it's like so frequently, I just don't want to drink the can because I'm getting oxidation and I just rather have a fresh pint from my basement. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I think about two weeks ago when we were drinking through all those non-alcoholic beers, right? How many of those, you know, the really unfortunate part is that there's nothing that the brewer can do. It might have been a fantastic beer coming right out of the brewery. But when you and me go to the grocery store and we buy it on the shelf and it's six months old, right? That's more than 12 weeks, by the way. And and I mean, it was refrigerated on a grocery store shelf, but, you know, probably wasn't refrigerated the whole time, <laughs> you know, but uh, but some of those beers clearly had oxidation impacts or, or what I I would call I don't know if it was oxidation I it's what I would call shelf stability issues right they started to taste gross or like sweet or like have this you know um, cardboard caramel flavor now so back to the study looking at how incognito versus pellet beers change over time the big takeaway from the study is we talked about differences at the beginning right when we characterized it but as the beers aged those differences got less and less got smaller and smaller and smaller and so over the 12-week 
period, the beer started to converge and taste the same, right? And which to me says, hey, okay, that means that oxidation or the, the beer shelf stability is dying. Right. And um, I th- there wasn't an analysis or at least not that I got from Michael. Um, there wasn't an analysis over like when the beer turned from like bad to, you know, from good to bad. Uh, because, again, we didn't do they didn't do any survivability analysis. They didn't do they didn't have consumers or anything like that. They're just looking at the characterization over time and then sort of plotting that out, um, you know, and you can see as the beers age. Yeah, they start to be more caramely and have these oxidation characters, caramel, honey, sweet candy you know, all this stuff as as the beers age. And I think that's pretty consistent. You know, I would love to see something that says like, okay, when is the beer no longer, when is the consumer no longer willing to purchase this beer, right? That would be really cool to see and see if like, hey, maybe Incognito is one month later, right? Maybe over this, again, 12 weeks of forced aging experiment, they converged to the same level and maybe they would still converge to the same level, but maybe you get a month more shelf stability out of using the incognito because it has those lower transition metals. That'd be something interesting to look at in the future. Yeah. A lot of variables are going to have an inflection point, right? Where um, maybe they start different, but then they converge um, or they uh, eventually one drops off, but they're really similar uh, for a long time together. And it just depends on the variable and the beer style, et cetera. You know, I did a malt comparison experiment uh, one time and they tasted pretty different um, prior to lagering. But then after a good lagering period, it's like, this is, I, psh, they taste the same. And so <laughs> yeah. it, it just depends on the variable, whether they start different and become similar or start same and eventually uh, one changes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, at least as we what we can say, the takeaway from this study is that at the end of this 12 week forced aging period in this study, the T90 and the incognito uh, performed the same, at least according to the to the uh, to the panelists. You know, so I think that's an interesting takeaway. Um, You know, I'd like to see some differences in the study in the future when we're looking at when we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, the 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 survivability analysis, for example. But still, what we can take away from this is, hey, incognito and T90, you know, at least age the same, right? You're not hurting the beer by using incognito. So again, you've got this new tool that you can use to improve, uh, augment the flavor, mix it together with T90 and hop extract. And then you've got a really, really good beer. You've got a nice, well-rounded beer that has all of the things that we want whenever we're brewing. So again, I, you know, I kind of like this. It's like it's kind of like there was no downside for Haas unless the in the hop extract sucked, which it didn't. You know, like ever the 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 panelists, um, you know, characterized it as being all of those things that we want in hoppy beer. So I think that's a nice takeaway from the study. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those times where non significant is okay. Um, that it's at least it wasn't worse. Yeah, exactly. At least it wasn't worse. And I have one more topic that I want to talk about real briefly before we close it up. So what are your thoughts on the future of hot products versus T90 versus whole cones? Maybe we should have spent some more time on this, but I want to spend like two minutes and then we'll drop it and maybe come back to it in a later episode. Yeah, I mean, one, I imagine that we're going to start to have access to more varieties in these flowable products. Uh, currently, it's more limited as they're kind of getting these things uh, figured out. So I'm excited to see that. Uh, and, you know, I joked earlier that I don't know that there's a need for a Hollertal Middle Fru uh, Incognito. Maybe there there is something there. And so maybe noble varieties could actually have some sort of uh, a place in the flowable world. Um, additionally, you know, I think that we're going to start to see more competitors, uh, just like uh, Lupamax was kind of the answer to cryo i would imagine that uh, in fact i think that there's one like cx or something like that uh that's coming out um that's not available to home brewers yet um so i also think we're going to start to see more flowable hot products um that that have different purposes so um maybe non-bittered ones so you can add s- crazy amounts of the whirlpool without getting any sort of bitterness or um light stable ones for the home brewer i i, I don't know it seems that there's going to be a lot of advancement, I think, in this kind of side of the industry. Yeah. And I, again, I think the big takeaway is what you mentioned earlier. Use these together, right? It's not intended to replace T90 products. That's my bad for using that that replacement word. It's not intended to replace T90 or whole cones. So use these together. I love the idea of the noble varieties, maybe in a product like Kettle Ready, because that was one of the big things I remember from talking with Jeff and Shay about these hot products is Kettle Ready also, it gives you the bitterness, but also the aroma of those varieties be interesting to use some of those like noble varieties as kettle ready extract 
And I know that people complain that we don't get the same quality of noble hops here in America. Um, and then some will even argue you might as well just use a Liberty or some sort of noble equivalent because you have so much better grasp on the quality, uh, even though it's grown domestically. So maybe this would be another way to kind of preserve some of those um, delicate characters um, that and get us even higher quality of uh, imported hot products here in the States. Totally. Yeah. It makes me wonder too, what's the shelf stability of the extract versus the pellets themselves, right? Like how does the extract age over time or what is, is it more stable uh, over time? Those are questions that I don't have the answers to. Jeff, if you're listening and you got any information, send that on. Um, if not, no worries. Uh, but yeah, so this is a really cool study to talk about like, you know, one of the, one example of a hop flowable hop extract product and how it changes the beer as it ages over time, not just as it ages over time, but how it cha- how it tastes. Um, immediately and then how it characterizes over time having differences in transition metals just so many things to look at Um, so really cool and really fun interesting information looking at this product yeah i'm super excited to see where this market goes yeah all right well uh, jordan and i'll be back in two weeks with our next applying the science episode so we'll see y'all then the brew lab is a production of brewlosophy where they who drink beer think beer don't forget to visit brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show the brewlosophy podcast thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible if you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy to see how you can do just that thanks so much for listening we'll be back in the brew lab with another guest next week until then think beer